um, maybe a couple of weeks after 9-11, this guy shows up to the firehouse. I happened to be there at the time. He said, listen, he goes, I took some pictures on 9-11. He goes, you might be interested in some of these. And it turns out he was on like the roof of a building in Brooklyn, right over, you know, Manhattan was a stone's throw away. And he took some pictures. And one photo he took, there's a fire truck going over the Brooklyn Bridge. And you can see that both towers burning in the background. And it turns out that that fire truck was ladder 118. So it turned into a front page of the Daily News, a whole story about off firehouse. And that became like uh, one of the, besides the guys raising the flag, it probably became the most iconic photo of 9-11. I remember that photo. Of six guys going to their death. You know, you're going over the bridge, you see the towers burning in the background. So when that, when that thing became news and it was in the Daily News, an elevator mechanic from the Marriott Hotel read the story. He gets in touch with the woman from the Daily News who wrote the article. She brings him to our firehouse because he remembered Ladder 118. He worked, he was an elevator mechanic in the Marriott. So this is how we found out the story of Ladder 118. Ladder 118 ended up in the Marriott Hotel. And he was working with them because he remembered the 118s on their helmets. And when he saw pictures of the guys, he remembered each guy who... You know, they, they got, people were trapped in elevators. Um, you know, people were stuck in their rooms because I think on the, like on the, one of the top floors of the hotel, there was a swimming pool that burst. So the water cascading down stopped the elevators. People couldn't get out of their rooms, whatever. So they, they got a lot of people out of the hotel. And then when debris started falling, they formed like a human chain where they wouldn't let anybody leave onto West Street because that's where all the debris was falling down. They made them leave onto the side street which name I still can't remember. And um, so they wouldn't let anybody leave. And he was with them. And then they all heard the rumble of the tower coming down. And he, this guy, Bobby Graff, that was his name, he said, everyone just started running. You didn't know where the rumble was coming from, who ran left, who ran right. And he, and he said he was with another mechanic, like side by side. And after the smoke cleared... He was in a spot where he survived. Everybody else died. And he said it just, you know, potluck which way you happen to run. So, and he said, he goes, to, he said he could see the look on the guy's faces from 118 that they knew that this was going to end bad, but they weren't leaving because they wanted to get as many people out safely as they could. And I kind of like remember saying to somebody in an interview once, it was kind of like, like the band going down with the ship on the Titanic, you know? And that's how we found out what Ladder 118 did that day. Otherwise, we, we never would have known. And um, <clears throat> we recovered Marty Egan's body probably like the first week into it. Um, you guys yourself? We didn't know. Another company. We didn't even know he was recovered until like maybe a day later. And then Scotty's body was recovered a couple of weeks afterwards. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not getting going to get into specifics, but a lot of guys were only identified through DNA. You know, like the families were dropping off hairbrushes, toothbrushes. So when, they, when we recovered bodies, they could do DNA, DNA analysis and find out who was who. So Marty Egan was recovered and um, Scotty's body was recovered. So we had funerals for them. And then it wasn't until sometime around Christmas, we got a call one day from... How old was Petey when he lost his pops? Pete was seven. Ah. And he had a sister, Casey, who was four when his father died. So um, And I got, a, I got a six and a four-year-old. I can only imagine. Yeah. And they know, man. They know that. They, they... Yeah, it's... it's um, Horrible. Lost a lot of, uh, um, I can't remember, but I think it was maybe in in my firehouse alone, um, like close to 20 kids lost a parent, you know, just in my firehouse. Yeah. So um, we got a call and sometime in December, around Christmas time, from to, just to take all these stories full circle. <clears throat> Marty... Egan was our captain. I told you he passed away. He worked in headquarters. He has a brother, Mark Egan, who was a lieutenant at the time. He was assigned to work ground zero 
he called us up. He goes, hey, we, we, we recovered Vernon Cherry's body. Vernon was one of the guys from my firehouse. Um, so I happened to be, wor- I actually wasn't working that day, but I was in the firehouse. So we, we said, well, we don't, don't take him. We'll be right there. We want to carry him out. So to the credit of the two officers working that day, they took a chance. We jumped on the fire trucks and we drove over the Brooklyn Bridge to Ground Zero because we wanted to carry our guy out. And um, not mentioning names, but one of the chiefs who was in charge of Ground Zero at the time intercepted us when we got to Ground Zero. He started screaming at our officers, you can't do this. What are you guys doing? You're working over there in Brooklyn. You just can't come over here and come to Ground Zero, blah, 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 blah. And I remember our captain, Billy Stark, I got to give him props. He, he told us, he goes, go, just go, go do what you got to do. So he stood there yelling with the chief, and we got to go down into the pit and carry Vernon's body out. And that meant the world to us that we were able to do that. And um, so I got to give our captain credit for, you know, it took a lot of heat for that, but we got to carry Vernon out. And then over the course of maybe the, the next week, I mean, we were there every day and we was always at the same spot. Vernon's body was recovered, right? Kind of like where we were digging. On New Year's Eve, we, 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 we recovered Joey Agnello. Then we recovered Pete Vega. And um, I found Bobby Regan. He was our lieutenant. And he was... And, um, he was wearing, um, he had a necklace on, and when I found him, I took it, I should have taken his necklace, but I didn't. I took his necklace, and I put it in his shirt pocket, and, and um, his wife got the necklace back, I think, the next day, and I had a very emotional talk with her about that whole thing. And um, I remember New Year's Eve, uh, I stayed at, at Ground Zero, until probably, I celebrated, uh, I celebrated New Year's Eve at, in the pit. I, I wanted to, sound stupid, but I, I wanted to be with those guys for that. I didn't want them to be alone because there was very few, you know, people working on New Year's Eve. So I stayed there till midnight. And then I got back to my firehouse about 1230 and um, went around the corner. There was a restaurant around the corner. I had, they, they gave me something to eat. And then, you know, that was like my New Year's Eve in, in 2001. And eventually, we recovered six out of the eight guys. Never found Leon Smith, and never found Bobby Wallace to this day. So, you know, to to be those families to have no grave to visit, it's it's as horrible as it all is. You know, it just makes it that more difficult to deal with. Next